Hopefully the sound is okay. I can hear myself, which is nice. All right, just going to wait for everyone to show up. Hello, I see the chat window is working now. Might give people just a couple more minutes to log on, so I'm not talking to myself. Hello, hello. All right, well, I hope everyone is doing well. Everyone's staying safe. Um, I might just go ahead and get started, and then if people trickle in, that'll be fine. Well, my name is Justin Robinson. I am a astronomy graduate student at Georgia State University. I measure distances and black hole masses of active galaxies, where the supermassive black hole in the center is actively feeding on stuff, gas and stars. And today, I wanna to talk to you about one of the greatest recent scientific discoveries. And about, uh, was it last Friday? I think last Friday, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration celebrated its one year anniversary of getting the image that you're staring at right now, which is the first ever real image of a black hole that we've gotten, which means every other image of a black hole that you've seen is fake. It's either an artist rendition or it's a simulation. 
But the only real image of a black hole that we have that's based on real data that we've gotten from telescopes is the one that you're seeing right now. And the reason why this is such a huge breakthrough is because there is so much to unpack in one image. There's so much physics and so much underlying stuff going on in the system where that black hole is, that's all contained in one image. And what I wanna do today is skim the surface as to what we can learn and what we can deduce and what we can measure just based on this one image that's uh, housed in a, in a active galaxy that's a giant elliptical galaxy. It's called Messier 87 or M87. And what I want to start with, just so that we can all understand what's happening and, and generally what's going on in this system, is I want to first establish what space-time is. Space-time is a general fabric. It's a three-dimensional fabric that all things in space are inside and can influence them if they have mass. So big, massive objects can create dense and they can create warps in this three-dimensional fabric of space-time. And so our Earth creates a big enough dent for our moon to rotate around. The sun creates a massive dent that all of the planets of the solar system orbit around. And if you, if it's easier to think of this, usually the thing to go to is if you've ever tossed a coin into one of these wells here, it's the same kind of idea where if you think about the, the central dip in the center as the curve that's caused by the mass of the sun, all of the little coins that are less massive rotate around it. But the thing with, with, diagrams like this and explanations like this, and even the grids that I was showing earlier, is that it's a it's a two-dimensional representation of something that's actually in three dimensions. And so everything is spiraling inwards because gravity is pulling them down, but gravity doesn't point down, gravity points inwards. And so this two-dimensional thing where it's bent in one specific direction is actually happening in three dimensions. And so the planets never spiral inward, they just keep traveling along these three-dimensional curves that are caused by these massive objects. And something else to keep in mind is that light also follows these curves and dents that are made in space. Light always has to travel through some sort of medium. On Earth, it travels through air. In space, you'd think that it might just be empty space, but the actual fabric is the medium that light travels through. And so it has to traverse any of the terrain that's caused by the bends, by the bends and the dents that are caused by any massive objects in their way. And so whatever curve that's made, light rays that are coming from behind it or around it need to travel along those curves as well. And we can actually observe this with stars that are close to our sun. Our sun makes a big dent in space and if any of the stars are near it or behind it, however much, however much light is emitted from the star, if it travels too close to the curve that the sun is making, it will get bent during its path to a telescope on Earth. And so if we try and trace back that light from that star, what we end up seeing is a position that where it appears to be, but that's not actually where it is. The actual position of the star is here. And that effect of traversing something and having it bent is has a less effect if you're farther away from it. And that's where you can see here. Stars over here are farther away from the curve that the sun is making in space time. And so when we try and trace back the actual light ray of light, it's not as far as uh, it's not as far from the actual position of the earth of the star. And you can see as far away back as here, it's far enough away from the sun where the path that the light takes doesn't really hit any peaks or valleys. It doesn't hit any dents on its way to us. And so there's not this double star effect. Now, even though our, our sun is massive enough to create a dent in space that all of the planets rotate around, relative to astronomical terms, it's not that big. And so these, these apparent star positions or light being bent by stars that traverse near our sun is not super apparent. What's really apparent is that if we look out into space and we see the dents in the curves caused by the most massive things like galaxies or even clusters of galaxies. And we can see these with really deep images created by the Hubble Space Telescope, where you expose for long enough and so you can see all of these faint galaxies start to appear. And what's happening in the center here is that these are two to five, maybe 10 massive elliptical galaxies that are all condensed into the same relative region of space. And so you're creating this really massive center of gravity. And what's happening here is that galaxies that are behind this cluster 
light is being emitted from them approaching the cluster and then getting bent and warped and so their light is getting smeared around the region of space that they are creating this giant curve this light this light and this light i believe are all from the same galaxy or, or small little cluster of galaxies that are behind this massive cluster and so they get dispersed into this lens that are that's being caused by the immense gravity of this cluster that's why we call this effect gravitational lensing where more the more gravity that you condense into a region the bigger the lens or this curve effect that takes place from the light that's being emitted from behind it and then hitting this curve and bending around it and so i want to keep that in mind the next thing that i want to talk about is knowing how space-time works and how light can be affected given the more that you dent it and the more that you curve it i want to actually know how you make a black hole and the last kind of vocab word that I want to keep in mind is this term called escape velocity, which really just means how fast do I need to travel in order to completely escape something's gravitational pull. For the Earth, its gravity is not that large. If I were to jump, I could resist Earth's gravity for maybe a split second before I'm pulled back down. And that's because my legs can't generate enough force to make me travel at a speed that's fast enough to leave the Earth's surface. The escape velocity of Earth is around 11, 10, 11 kilometers per second, which in miles per hour is tens of thousands of miles per hour. I think it's about 30,000 miles per hour, which means that anything that has escaped the surface, any telescopes that we've sent out into space, any rockets that we've sent out to explore the solar system, uh, any rockets in general, in order to get away from Earth's gravity, they need to at least be traveling at about 20 to 25,000 miles per hour in order to not fall back down into the Earth. The force that they need to propel themselves forward has to be greater than the force that Earth is, is exerting on them to pull them back down to the surface. And so gravity is related to mass. The more mass I have, the more stuff I have, the more gravity that I'm going to produce. But I want to change it up. Let's pretend that I have a massive sphere here, and I don't want to change the mass at all. I want to keep the amount of mass there. But instead, I want to condense this region down. I want to increase the density. I want to push this thing further closer together. And the more that I do that, I want to know what the effect has on the escape velocity. And so this arrow is going to track how much you would need to go, how fast you would need to go in order to escape this thing's gravitational pull. So if I push it closer together, the speed at which I would need to go increases. I've increased the density. I've increased the amount of weight that this thing has. And so I need to travel faster to get away from it. And if I keep condensing it more, the speed at which I would need to go increases more. And this effect is going to keep happening. But in reality, it's taking more and more force for me to push this thing further down. It's taking more force for me to condense this thing. And what's happening is that these I'm pushing the atoms closer together and the repulsion between atoms is getting stronger and stronger the closer that I push them together. So in reality, I would run out of energy. I would run out of force that was necessary to keep pushing this thing down. But just for the sake of this example, I'm going to pretend that I have some sort of way to have an infinite amount of force, an infinite amount of things or infinite amount of energy to keep compressing this thing downward. And so if I were to somehow compress this thing down to infinity, the escape velocity would also go to infinity. And so this, this seems like something that wouldn't normally happen, but it kind of happens all the time. It happens when massive stars die. Somehow they're able to generate enough force, enough energy to compress something down into an infinitesimally small point. And so if I did that, what have I just created? I've created a point that's infinitesimally small that I'm representing with a finite circle, just so you can see it. But pretend that you can't, it's so small that you can't detect it with a microscope. All of the mass that I started with is still in that point. The only thing that I've done is compress everything down. All of that mass is contained within that point. But what I've done now is I've created some sort of region around it where the escape velocity has now skyrocketed. So I've created a region around this point where the escape velocity has actually gotten larger than the speed at which light travels. Light travels at a finite speed. It's the speed limit of the universe. And so however much mass I started with that I compressed down, that's related to how much of a region that I've created where the escape velocity would be larger than the speed of light. And this is one of the common misconceptions about black holes. 
there is no surface of a black hole. All of the mass that I started with is in that central point. It's in this core. And the blackness, the, the, the sphere shape that's created is not a surface. It's not a solid sphere. It's just a boundary that separates where the speed of light has, or the, sorry, the escape velocity has exceeded the speed of light and where the speed of light is just enough to get away from this object that I've just created. That boundary is the surface of a black hole, but it's not, you can't touch it. It's just a separate region. It's, that's why we call it the event horizon. In order to witness an event in astronomy or in any walk of life, you need, to, you need photons. You need photons to be able to travel from wherever they are to your eyes or to your detector or to your telescope. If the escape velocity of some object is greater than the speed of light, the photons will never get to you. They'll be dragged back down. And so we need to have photons that are generated outside of this, outside of this boundary in order to travel to us. So in order for us to see an event, it needs to happen in this region where the speed of light is fast enough to get away from this object. And so we call that the event horizon. And however long the distance is between that central point that I made where all of my mass is and this separate boundary, this event horizon, we call that the Schwarzschild radius, named after the guy who derived what the equation was from Einstein's equations of general relativity. Okay, that was a little physics-y, but Keep in mind, there is no surface of a black hole. It's just that separate region between where light can and can't escape. All of the mass is still there in that central point. And so literally, what would I see? What would I see if I just created this in space? I, this is exactly what I see. I wouldn't see anything. Light can't escape from a black hole. And so if it's out there in space and nothing's around it, I would have no way to detect it. I would have no way to see it, except if it's interacting with something else that is emitting light. And that's how we study black holes in astronomy. We can't study them by themselves, but if they're in an environment, if they're interacting with things, if they're influencing how things move and how things behave, that we can observe. We can observe their influence. And so let's pretend that I created a black hole and I have some sort of gas or something that's being heated up and emitting light that's orbiting around the black hole. That is something that I can observe. But I can only observe them in specific scenarios. And by that, I mean that they would need to be orbiting around the black hole in what we call stable orbits. What do I mean by stable orbit? What I mean is things need to be happening for a long period of time in order for us to observe them in astronomy. The moon's orbit around the Earth is stable. It's been doing it for a long time. It will keep doing it for a long time. Earth's rotation around the sun is stable. It will keep doing it for a long period of time. The amount of time that humans are here on Earth is minuscule compared to astronomical timescales. Things don't really change in astronomy. And so, and we only observe things for even smaller times than that. For the amount of time that humans have been here, the time that we've been observing the universe is minuscule, right? And so in order for us to observe events, they need to have been happening for a long period of time, longer than the time that we observe them. And so in order for us to see things that are orbiting around a black hole that can make things change really, really fast, even on human timescales, is that they need to be on stable orbits. They need to be happening for a long period of time in order for us to see them and observe them. So these photons that I've created with my, with my artwork here, these are orbiting in stable orbits. They keep repeating their process. These are happening for a long period of time. And so the chances of us observing them here on Earth are really high. The point that I want to make here is that the stable orbit of a photon or something that's orbiting around a black hole is bigger than its radius, is bigger than the Schwarzschild radius. So this is farther away from the black hole instead of right next to it. And so if I had a photon that was closer, it would spiral inwards. This is an unstable orbit. So if it was closer, the force of gravity would be so high, force of gravity would be so high that it would take it out of its orbit and drag it back into the black hole. And you can see that these photons out here trace out a slightly bigger region than just the black hole. If we were to somehow, by, by some chance, follow this single photon as it travels inward, it would actually trace out the shape of the black hole here. So the black hole is somewhere here, and the photons that we would be able to observe normally are way out here. 
And so the last stable orbit of a photon is greater than the radius of the black hole that we made. And it's an important thing to keep in mind. So I said that massive objects can create big dents and warps in space and light has to follow these curves. So if we create a black hole that creates the biggest dent in space that we can make, I wanna know how that influences the light that's coming from things that are orbiting around it. So let's say that I had a disk of gas that's orbiting around this black hole, just like Saturn's rings are rotating around Saturn. I wanna create a thin disk of really heated up gas that's emitting a lot of bright light that's orbiting around the black hole. What happens is that this black hole creates such a huge lensing effect that if we were to observe it like this, the light that's coming from the accretion disk, what we call it because the black hole is accreting matter around it in a disk-like sort of fashion, and so we call it an accretion disk. The light that's being emitted from behind the black hole from the accretion disk is going to travel through space that the black hole is influencing and get bent upwards and below it. That same lensing effect that happened with those galaxies that were passing through that big uh, cluster of galaxies, the same thing is going to happen here, but to a really, really strong extent, where the black for the space time is so curved that the light from behind is going to be bent all the way around it, creating this halo effect. And this isn't physical. The only thing physically there is the black hole and the accretion disk. This halo that's created here is just from the lensing effect. This is just a result of how warped the space time is around it, that it's bending all of the light around it due to the mass of gravity. I hope somebody has seen something like this before. This is why the black hole in interstellar looks like this because they actually adopted real physics in their simulation of what this black hole looked like. It, it was actually, they normally you don't get this much funding to run simulations that, that, that take this much computing power, but a Hollywood movie has a really, really high budget. And so they were able to simulate their new physics and theories on black holes and what they would do to surrounding matter that this image here, this part of the movie actually got two scientific papers published. But this is what happens. The light from behind the black hole that's coming from this accretion disk is lensed around it in this bright halo. And remember, this is 3D space. So no matter where you were looking, you would see this same image, right? No matter where you're looking, it's going to bend it towards you, towards the observer, no matter at what angle you were looking at it. As long as the accretion disk was still kind of like horizontally attached to it and so that it would bend it upwards and downwards just like this. Because they used super updated theories on black holes and gravity, this is the most realistic depiction of a black hole in media. But they still forgot one thing. Everything else is pretty much right, except this one thing. And I can't speak for whatever happened to Matthew McConaughey after he fell into the black hole, but everything before that, scientifically accurate. The one thing that they didn't take into account is the effect of motion the effect that motion has on light. So light that's coming towards you or away from you is going to have an effect as to what it looks like. And this is, if anybody's heard of it, it's called the Doppler effect. And I assume that most people have heard of this, but just in case, let's imagine that you're standing on the side of a road and you hear a car coming towards you. And usually I'm in a classroom of students and I make them say the noise to me, but the sound that it makes is more energetic or higher frequency when it comes towards you and lower frequency when it's coming when it's going away from you. The reason why that is, is because the car that's emitting sound, the engine, it's not changing its sound. It's doing its same thing and emitting the same sound waves. But depending on how fast it's moving towards you, those sound waves get compressed. And so if you were to think of a wave, you would hear more peaks per second. And so you would hear the sound more frequently. So the frequency goes up the more that those sound waves are compressed. The opposite effect happens when the car moves away from you. Again, the engine's doing the same thing, but the sound waves are getting stretched out the farther or the faster that the car moves away from you. And so you hear the, the peaks of the sound waves less frequently, so the frequency goes down in the sound that you hear. The same kind of effect happens with light. Light, is also, light also behaves like a wave. And so when light is coming towards you, those light waves get compressed. And so the color that you see shifts to a more energetic color and so on and on the EM spectrum, blue is a higher energy than red. And so when something is coming towards you, 
the light is going to be shifted more towards a bluer color. We call that blue shift. And the opposite effect happens when something is going away from you. The wavelengths get stretched out. And so the color that you see gets shifted to lower energy. So it's shifted more towards the red side of the spectrum. So if we apply that idea here, remember, nothing is moving still in space. We're moving around with the Earth as it rotates around its axis, as the Earth rotates around the sun. The same thing happens in this system, where these, this disk around the black hole is more than likely spinning. So let's say that it's spinning in this way. If that's the case, that means that this side of the disk is always going to be moving towards you. And this side of the disk is always going to be moving away from you. So we have to take into account the amount of red shifting or blue shifting that's going to happen depending on how fast this disk is rotating. So if the part of the disk is moving towards you is going to be shifted to higher frequency colors and the side that's moving away from you is going to be shifted to lower energy colors. So the actual image of the black hole that we would get would probably look something like this, where one side is shifted to more energetic colors and the other side is shifted more towards the red colors. Now, hopefully this is starting to look like the image of the black hole that we know of, but I wanna go into the actual system now. So we've got, we've got all of our physics set up, we've got all of our science set up. So now we wanna know what we're looking at, why we target the specific galaxy we targeted. This is Messier 87. This is the galaxy that hosts the black hole that we took a picture of. So this is the massive elliptical galaxy here. And this is a giant jet, a relativistic jet, meaning that it's probably moving at speeds that are close to the speed of light. This jet was emitted from the center of the galaxy. We call it an active galaxy because the black hole in there is actively accreting matter. And black holes, the way I like to describe them is black holes are very messy eaters. And so they don't really eat things in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice, clean way. Most of the stuff actually gets spewed back out at really, really fast speeds. You ever, in, ever in a sci-fi movie you hear that they're going to go close to a planet to, to slingshot or something like that? That's because the more massive you go towards something, the faster that you're going to accelerate because of gravity. And if you miss hitting the planet, then it's going to shoot you off with some higher speed because it's been accelerating you the, the whole time. The same thing happens with matter that's getting close to a black hole. If it flies towards a black hole, accelerating the whole time because of gravity, but doesn't go in, it's gonna get flung back out. And this is exactly, what happening, it's exactly what's happening with these jets here. This is highly energetic gas and dust that's being accelerated outwards from the black hole because it didn't quite fall in. And we see this in nature all the time. It actually happens from the north and south pole of a black hole. So we're looking at either the north or south pole here, and there should be another jet coming out this way. One reason why we might not be is because this galaxy is way brighter than the, than the light behind it. But also remember, blue shifts and red shifts. This jet is coming towards us, and so its energy is shifted towards really high energy colors, so blue wavelengths, right? If this is moving away from us at nearly the speed of light, it's probably redshifting all the way past colors that we can detect with our eyes. And so it's probably in the infrared or the microwave or something. And the Hubble Space Telescope, which can see the infrared, the visible, and the ultraviolet, probably can't even detect this jet here because it's been redshifted so far into other wavelengths that the Hubble Space Telescope just can't see. But this is the galaxy that we targeted. And so what's going on in the center here that would cause this massive jet, that would cause uh, a really highly energetic accretion disk, just like the one I was showing in my cartoon. The way that we made sure of this is that we ran scientific models and simulations to see what was happening in this system, what we thought was happening in this system, and maybe whether or not we could get a picture of it. And so a university in Germany, um, in Frankfurt, ran a simulation of what this galaxy was doing. And so here's the accretion disk around this central supermassive black hole. Here are the jets that I was talking about, both the North and the South Pole. And what this thing can do is it can rotate things around and see how the system has to be oriented in order to reproduce the things that we actually observe. And so the accretion disk is probably really, really close to the black hole. And it's got to be perpendicular to this jet that's coming out. And so what's probably happening in this system is that the the disk that's rotating around the black hole is probably nearly what we call face on, flat. 
and then just slightly edged towards us, right? So it's if this was a plane here, the accretion disk would probably be dipping just slightly towards us, spiraling like this, and then the jet would be almost pointed at us but missing us just slightly. And then they can zoom in and say, this is what the actual telescopes that we used for the Event Horizon Telescope would see. These are the radio wavelengths that are coming out. So this is what the telescopes see. And this is different from the image that I created earlier because I had the disk this way. Remember, this is all three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional images. I had the disk this way that got lensed this way. What we're seeing here is not that center accretion disk cutting through the center, we're seeing it like this. And so the accretion disk must be face on like this without that lensing effect happening. And so I want to just experiment and take their data and see what would happen if I took this system and started rotating it like this. What would happen to the image that I would get if I started rotating the system like this? If I did, I would start to see that lensing effect again. Here I see the middle, the middle of the accretion disk here but that halo on the top and bottom never goes away because even if I rotate the, the system so that the accretion disk is edge on like this, the light from behind still gets bent up and around the top and bottom of the black hole. But we would still see that, that middle region. And so what this is telling us is that the actual system that we imaged of M87, the black holes, the, the accretion disk, excuse me, the accretion disk is almost completely face on. We don't see that center disk anymore. And so here now is an actual series of images that were taken because this black hole was, was observed over a couple of periods of time, a couple of, a couple of different dates. And so this is actually what the system looks like in a time series where you see it's a little bit variable on the top and bottom, but the whole accretion disk system is still the same. But what's weird to me is that this bottom part is way brighter than the top part. And it's going to zoom out here and show you what the system looks like again from the model. There it goes. And so why, if this disk is completely face on, why would I see a difference in color between the top and the bottom? That's because of this, the same thing. It's the red shifting and blue shifting idea. If this system is completely face on, but it's scooted just slightly in our, in our field of view, or it's slightly pointing towards us, but mostly this way. That means that however it's rotating, it's going to boost some light given whatever part of the disk is coming towards us. And then it's going to shift whatever part of the disk is going away from us to lower frequencies. And if the bottom part of the disk, if the bottom part of the disk is brighter, that must mean that the system is orbiting this way, clockwise. From I hope this is clockwise from your right? Clockwise? Yeah, clockwise where this part of the bottom part of the disk must be the part that's moving towards you. Because if that was moving towards you, that means that that light would get shifted to brighter and brighter colors. So it would be a brighter image, which we see here. And that means the top part must be the part that's going away from you because it's the part that's dimmer. And so just from this image, we can tell that one, the accretion disk is near face on. Two, how it's rotating because the bottom part of the disk is brighter, so it must be the part that's always coming towards us. And so we've got the orientation, we've got the rotation direction, and we've got what they called, when they first released this image, they called it the shadow of the black hole, meaning this is what they call the shadow. Because remember, in order for us to see these photons, they're the ones that need to be rotating in stable orbits. And so we're not seeing the ones that get too close, that spiral inwards. We're seeing the ones that have been doing this thing for a really long time. And so we're seeing a region that is just slightly bigger than the actual radius of the black hole. So here is not the black hole. It's a region that's slightly bigger. The black hole is probably in here somewhere. And so hopefully now that I've covered all this, just from this one image, we can get so much detail from what's happening in this system, what's happening to the gas in this system, where the black hole is, how big it probably is. It's, I forgot the actual measurement, but it's around the size of the solar system. So from the center, from the sun's center out to Pluto, it's about how big this thing is. And we can measure the mass if we measure how fast this gas is rotating, which we did. And it's about 6 billion times the mass of our sun, I think. So, so much science to unpack from just one image. 
And this is just the first part of this thing. So I want to kind of look into the future. This happened just a couple of days ago. The same telescope, the same um, radio telescopes that are spread throughout the globe that, that add up to about half of the Earth's surface that they use to observe this thing, they're still targeting other objects. And this is a result that happened just a couple of days ago. They tar targeted a faraway um, galaxy that's also emitting a jet, just like M87 was. And they show you the increased angular resolution that they're able to get with a telescope that this, that's this big. And so here's an image that we used to have. Here's a telescope that is part of the Event Horizon Telescope Array. And then this is the amount of resolution that they're able to get with their improved telescope. So they've broken up this part of the jet into two separate regions. I forget that they always make a metaphor for the for the, like how much uh, angular resolution that they have. I think now their metaphor is that they can resolve uh, an orange on the surface of the moon or something like that. But jets like this, just like M87s, where it was supposed to be, they're usually just straight jets traveling in one direction. Here, we don't observe that. We see clumps. We see two jets pointing in opposite directions. And so what they think is happening is that this jet is just just been emitted from the accretion disk, which they think this part is, but is still influenced by the immense gravity of the black hole. So it's being kicked. It's being shredded and pulled outwards or um, in an angle away from the accretion disk, which is something that we've never observed before. We've ran models and we've run simulations with the physics that we know, and they tell us, hey, this might be happening. But as far as observing an actual event, we've never seen something like this before. And so just like the first image of the black hole that confirmed so many theories that we had about black holes, about general relativity, this thing is telling us the same thing. Jets are behaving like we think they are, which is good, which means that what we think is happening in physics is actually happening, which is always a good thing. And I want to move past this because the next big thing that this telescope is going to do is it's going to give us an image of our black hole in the center of our Milky Way, which is Sagittarius A star. We've already done a lot of work observing this thing. So this, I hope the video plays okay. This is a time lapse of actual stars in the center of our Milky Way that are orbiting around the thing that we can't see, but what we know to be the central supermassive black hole. And to put it in context, the black hole in M87 is billions with a B, billions of times the mass of the sun. Our black hole in the center of our Milky Way is much, much smaller, relatively. It's only millions of times the mass of the sun. And so it's much smaller, but it's still making stars move extremely fast at small fractions of the speed of light. And we can throw that into other computer simulations and we can see what would the center of the galaxy look like if we mapped out all of the stellar orbits. And that's what this simulation is showing. Very chaotic system. Everything is in different orbits, but all are being influenced by the mass of that central supermassive black hole. And what the Event Horizon Telescope wants to do is that it wants to image this black hole. But I want to build it up and kind of give you some context. The black hole at the center of M87 is very, very active. That accretion disk doesn't change on very long time scales. And so no matter when they observed it, they would have gotten around the same image because the accretion disk isn't changing that much. Our black hole used to be really active, but it's not very active anymore. And so the amount that it feeds or the amount that it almost eats things and then flings them away is a lot more sporadic. It doesn't happen very often. And so when you observe it at one day or another, it might look very, very different. And so I don't think that the image that we eventually get of our black hole of Sagittarius A star, I don't think it'll look as nice as the one in M87. Um, but it'll be interesting to see because it it hopefully will outline very nicely, like in a, in a, in a nice little donut, what Amy, M87 does, but I really don't know. It's going to look very, very different, which means it's going to look really interesting. And the other last thing I want you to keep in mind is that we observed M87, which is a galaxy outside of our own. And so we didn't have to deal with the stuff that's around us that blocks our view of everything. Also remember, this is a, a computer simulation of what we think the Milky Way looks like. We don't have a picture of the Milky Way. We can't send a camera up, turn it around, and take a picture of the entire Milky Way disk. That would take 
millions of years to do because that's how big the Milky Way is. So this is what we think the Milky Way looks like. And we're pretty sure that we're right here in one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. That's about eight kiloparts, 8,000, 25,000 light years away from the center. And so in order to image something that's here, whoops, sorry. In order to image something that's here, we need to look through all of this galaxy in order to see what's in the center. That's why we use radio. Radio can travel through all that stuff. You can still hear the radio in your car, whether it's day or night, cloudy, sunny, whatever. But it still gets influenced by how much stuff it needs to go through in order to get to us. And so there's a lot of um, obstacles that get in the way of us imaging the center of our Milky Way. So the image of our black hole is my, the point that I'm making. The image of our black hole is going to look very, very different. But that makes it interesting because we have to have put in so much more work to get an image of our black hole just because it's in the place that we live and we have to look through so much stuff to get to it. But that's all that I have today. Uh, we are all part of the Got Space program, the Georgia Outreach Team for Space. So I want to thank the Georgia Space Grant Consortium and Georgia Tech for putting this on and our affiliate schools here, Kennesaw State, Georgia State, uh, the Green Bank Observatory, which has sponsored a bunch of our stuff. Um, and hopefully uh, there's a little bit of a delay, but I can still see your guys' questions. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. April must be, wasn't nearly one year ago. Yes, it was, last Friday was the one year anniversary of when the, uh, when the picture of M87 was released. So April must be a good month for black holes. Hi, Justin Carson. Hi, Carson. Uh, let me, whoa, there we go. There is a slight delay, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. What do you think about spaghettification? <laughs> uh, I think spaghettification is one of the greatest words ever invented. Um, it's actually it's actually a, a real word, and it, all that it does is that it, it it describes what happens if you fell into a black or if anything falls into a black hole, because the the gravity is so large that even even on earth you're shorter during the day than you are when you sleep because when you're standing on earth gravity is pulling you downwards and so the gravity shrinks you down a little bit and when you lay down the gravity is now pulling all of you down at the same point so you're able to stretch back out on a on near the surface of a black hole the if you fell in feet first the gravity on your feet would be so much higher than the gravity on your head that they would actually be pulled harder than your head would. And so you will literally be stretched out. And so we had to create a word for that. And some awesome physicists came up with spaghettification, which is just awesome to say. And it and it's just, it's one of my favorite words. How many light years away is M87? Oh, that's a good question. It's at least, it's at least a couple million light years away. Um, I can't remember the exact number. I can Google it, but that'd be cheating. My guess is a couple million light years. Um, at least 10 or 10 or 15 million light years. Um, the reason why we chose it is because it's so much more massive than our, so we, we chose uh, uh, two targets to image first to test out the, the event horizon telescope. One was obviously our black hole because it's the closest. And the other was one of the biggest black holes that we know of um, in a system that is highly active, which means that the black hole is, is really, really feeding on everything around it. Um, the reason why we didn't, go and try and get an image of ours first is because it's not very active and it's not very big. And so its influence on stuff isn't as powerful as the one in M87. So roughly the resolution and the images of the two will be about the same because even though M87 is millions of light years away, the black hole is so much bigger and its effect is so much higher that it's about the same activity that we would get in our images. Um, did you have anything to do with finding this black hole? No, unfortunately not. Um, I, I keep saying we because once you get into the scientific community and you start writing papers and you start having collaborators, you say we instead of I. Um, so no, unfortunately not. Um, our work at Georgia State University, at least with my research group, um, we target 
other active black holes in other galaxies um, that are close by. And what we do is we track the, we, this is actually I, I do this. Um, we, we, I track the motion around the black hole and I use the motion of that gas around the black hole to actually constrain how massive a black hole is. And so my advisor, Dr. Misty Bentz, is actually one of the leading supermassive black hole experts in the world. And she has helped measure the masses of about a hundred supermassive black holes in other active galaxies. Um, what is your personal favorite thing about astrophysics and why did you choose to study this particular field? My favorite part of astrophysics is probably black holes um, because there is there is so much that we don't know. Like Everybody will tell you what happens when you fall into a black hole, what happens to the stuff around a black hole, how massive it is, how big it is. Not a single person on this planet can tell you what happens if something falls into a black hole. We don't know. It's probably not a bookcase that's that's spying on Matthew McConaughey's daughter in her bedroom. We're prob we're pretty sure that's not the case. Um, but as far as that, we don't know. We don't know what happens at the center of a black hole. Um, and I think that's awesome. I think that's I think that the amount of people working on black holes and black hole theories, and none of them can agree on what happens at the center. I think that's really cool. And to to do to do something about black holes that we can actually observe and how that might help the things that we think are going on in the center. I think that's really cool. Um, how did I how did I choose it? I chose it. Uh, I chose it because of Morgan Freeman. Um, and if there's anybody who knows me in the chat, you've already heard this story. But the reason that I got into black holes to begin with was because uh, in high school, I was bored one night trying to fall asleep and I found a TV show narrated by Morgan Freeman. And I'm like, oh, perfect. I love Morgan Freeman's voice. It'll put me right to sleep. It's so soothing. And uh, and he's, he was it was uh, through the wormhole with Morgan Freeman. And so it was a, a TV show on the Sci-Fi Channel. And he started talking about black holes and he started talking about wormholes and and galaxies and neutron stars. And I didn't sleep that night because I'm like, oh, this thing is, these things are really cool. And so every time that I could choose a project that I did in high school or in college or when I had to research something, it was always black holes and it was always galaxies. And for some reason, my interest in it has just never gone away to the point where that was two, four, six, seven, eight, almost nine years ago that that happened. And nine years later, I'm still really interested in, in what I study about black holes. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, what is the current timeline for creating an image of Sagittarius A star? That is a great question. That is a fantastic question. Um, you could ask that question about anything that we that we observe, but uh, for the recent bug that's going around, I think that that's closed most telescopes on Earth, and so whatever observing that we had planned is probably going to get pushed back. I know that with the image that was created last year, I know that they observed it in 2017. The data was got that was observed in 2017. And then it took them two years of analysis to get it uh, 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 to produce the image. And I think that the observations of Sag, Sag A star were around the same time. And so I know that they have the data and I know that they are in the process of making it. So if I were to guesstimate, I would say maybe in the next year or two. But now that we, yeah, or it has to come to a complete stop. Um, observing now has gone to a complete stop. I don't know if they needed to get more data or not, I think they have all that they need. It's just the process of making it, which takes a lot of supercomputing time, which I would imagine gets really complicated when no one's at the office right now, unfortunately. So I would hope really soon. I would hope that it gets out as soon as I, as soon as we can. But I I couldn't I couldn't tell you. Um, what do you plan to do once you complete your degree at Georgia State? I hope to do this, what I'm doing right now, but in front of a classroom of college students. Um, I find I find talking about the things that I find really cool, really cool, uh, and uh, and and getting to get uh, getting to talk about it and getting to share the things that I think are cool and ongoing research about things that we continually find out new things about. I mean, that's with every science, but I think it's cool to be able to know this much stuff about something that we can't test in a lab, for example. Um, it's not like biology or chemistry um, or even particle physics, where we, we can't we can't simulate things on Earth that recreate the environments that we see in the universe. 
And so it's a constantly rapidly evolving area of study. And I think that no matter how long I would teach it for, there would always be new things to talk about and always new things to discover and new things to understand. And so it would never get stagnant. It would never get boring. I don't really get bored talking about this stuff, even if I keep talking about the same things. But uh, as far as a career standpoint, I feel like this would never, ever get boring because things are always changing. Thank you, by the way, everybody, for the questions. Um, if anybody else has any, um, even if you've submitted one, there's a, there's a slight delay. So. This is really fun. It's weird. It's weird not being in front of people. Uh, I don't know. I don't know for sure if I've made anybody laugh. I know I made myself laugh. I hope. I hope this has been a little funny. Uh, and usually, I can look in people's faces while I'm giving a presentation to see if they're lost or uh, if they don't understand something or if they think that I'm a complete wacko, um, which is good because then I'll go back and try to explain something different. But uh, I've just been staring at my face this whole time, and I know what I'm talking about. So. Um, what is the most intriguing thing you've witnessed viewing the cosmos? Cosmos is such a great word. Um, thank you for the question. Most interesting thing that I've observed. Uh, it's been fun to see the, like the mistakes or the mishaps that happen when you're observing. Um, the first time, so I've used, a, I've used a couple of telescopes. I've used regular Optical telescopes, um, things where telescopes are trying to see th the same things that our eyes see. Most of my stuff has been observing in radio, which our eyes can't see. So you need really, really big telescopes. And um, when you get when so when you, for for research grade telescopes, the normal process is that you submit a, a proposal to say, hey, I want to observe these things. Here's why. Here's the science that I'm going to do with them. Here's why you should give me time on your telescope, this competitive time. And most of the time it gets rejected, but sometimes you get accept it if you write a really really good proposal and so if you're an observer like i've been and you get time on this multi-million dollar piece of equipment and they say okay the controls are yours take it away it's uh really really nerve-wracking to be the one to push the button and make the telescope go where you tell it to go especially the telescope that i use which is as tall as a rocket ship and i think like a couple uh, millions of tons i think i'm probably overestimating but it's a big it's a big thing um, and so I guess just, uh, seeing my first observation of something that I told a telescope to go and do, I think is by default, the best thing that I've ever observed because one, I didn't break it Two, I pointed it at the right thing, which means I didn't waste the time that I got like put all the time in writing a proposal, which means my advisor wasn't mad at me, which is great. Um, and I also was like was I was able to do science with the thing that I got. I was observing I was observing a galaxy, and in radio, if you observe it in a specific part of the radio, you can measure how fast it's rotating. And so I got the observation, I worked with the data, and I was able to measure how fast a galaxy was rotating based on observations that I got without breaking the telescope, based on a proposal that I helped to write that got approved. Um, and so I think by default, that's probably the coolest thing that I've ever observed. Um, how many black holes are there in the whole universe? <sighs> well, since the Hubble Space Telescope was invented, um, the big one of the, I mean, it's made so many seminal discoveries about the universe. But one of the biggest things that it observed that it that that it discovered was that in every major galaxy, so every galaxy that's even smaller than our Milky Way, our Milky Way definitely, and then bigger galaxies. Every single major galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, meaning a uh, supermassive meaning that it's um, millions of times, if not billions of times, the mass of the uh, the mass of the sun. For the galaxies that we've measured the mass of here at Georgia State, it ranges from a million to a billion, so about ten to the six to ten to the nine solar masses. So we know that there, uh, approximately every galaxy has a black hole at its center. As far as how many galaxies there are in the universe, think of the biggest number that you can imagine and then add like nine zeros to it. And that's probably still not the amount of galaxies that there are in the universe. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, I was abducted by an alien once, was fun and stuff. 
I hope you took pictures because that's that's a pretty big thing. Um, time inside a black hole, stop or does it slow to a crawl? Inside, I have no idea, and neither does anybody else. As far as time as you get closer to a black hole, so all the things that I went to with, um, with the curvature of space-time and how uh, it gets dented the more mass that you add to a system, the amount that, that space bends, time also bends. And so the bigger a bend that you make, the slower that you make time go in that region. And we've actually measured this with atomic clocks. Us on the surface of the Earth are closer to the Earth's mass than something that's in orbit around the Earth because we're on its surface. And we've measured this with people that are in the Inter International Space Station. We synchronized clocks to go at the same time. And then we saw what the difference was. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, time for us should move slower, slightly, than for it, than it does for the people in the International Space Station. And that is exactly what we observed. And so if you're close to a black hole, the closer you are to it, the slower that time goes for you. And so black holes are actually time machines, as long as you don't fall into it, because time will move slower for you than it will for somebody else that's farther away from something that has a lot of mass. And so uh, if you were to orbit around a black hole for a long enough period of time, you would come back to Earth and Earth would be, you know, hundreds or thousands of years into the future and you would have aged, you know, a couple of days, which is pretty cool. Um, I think from an observer outside the black hole, yes. <laughs> yes, okay, observer's viewpoint, yes. Oh, from an observer's viewpoint, yeah. So um, you would witness... Uh, what would actually happen if you were to observe somebody falling into a black hole, what you would observe is like a, a really, really accelerated redshift where it's being their, their light is being dragged back down more and more the closer that they get to a black hole. And so the light that's emitted from them or light that bounces off from them are going to be stretched out more and more the closer that they get. And so if, if, if you were wearing something that emitted blue light, the closer that you got to it, I would see it shift to yellow, to green, to red, to really dark red, and then you would disappear because then your light that was being emitted is going to shift into infrared, and then it's going to shift into microwave, and then it's going to shift into radio, and then it's just going to shift into nothingness. It's going to observe. It's going to shift into um, infinitely less energetic light, and then you would, like you would just slowly fade out of existence. Yeah, the bigger dilation, exactly. So I would, I would I would literally watch you fade away, which is frightening but awesome at the same time. And I'm really glad that I'm not the one falling into the black hole in this scenario. The spaghettification still happens, by the way. <laughs> You're still being pulled. So it's like I was. I think that the example that I just went through, you were just a a dot. That was emitting light, but if you were a person, right, the the red shifting uh, from your feet would be uh, it would be red shifted farther than your head, and so I would see your feet disappear before your head would. It's kind of morbid, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I think this thing is scheduled for an hour, and so we have about three minutes for questions. So if anybody has any last minute questions. About black holes, about the universe, about anything, I would be more than happy to answer. Or I can just sit listening to the fan of my computer go crazy because it's probably super overheated now. <laughs> mm -hmm. One thing, if you get into grad school that I didn't know, or for, for GSU at least, uh, tech probably does the same thing. Uh, is that you're given a computer when you when you get there you get, you're given a new computer and an office i didn't expect that either i was given an office All right, if there are no more questions i might i might sign off um, for those who have joined thank you so much for watching and listening for those who ask questions thank you so much I hope this becomes a regular thing because we're all supposed to stay home now. We're all supposed to we're all supposed to self isolate. Oh, what do you think we will learn from the Parker Solar Probe? Uh, why is the last question something that I don't know? <laughs> I 
I don't know what that is. Oh, this is embarrassing. Well, I hope that we'll learn a lot. I hope that we learn. I hope that we learn exactly what it's meant to observe. I'll say that. Oh, that's a great note to end on, isn't it? <laughs> hey, sometimes, sometimes you don't know. That's exactly what happens with research. You get so involved into one specific area that every other area of science just kind of falls to the wayside. And then you know the same thing as some stranger that you would pull off the street. Uh, that's my excuse for not knowing what that is. But with that, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for your questions. This was really fun. I hope you guys had fun. And hopefully, we will keep doing these in the future. But uh, I hope everyone's okay. I hope everyone is safe. And hopefully, I will see you again. Bye-bye.